um, first mathematical topic of the, of the course uh, is the, uh, the Markovich mean variance model. Uh, a little bit of introduction to, to the Markovich model. Um, well, Harry Markovich got, uh, wrote a PhD back in, uh, that, that he finished back in 1952, uh, which dealt with, um, well, asset allocation using an optimization model that I'm going to present uh, to you in a minute. Um, but uh, essentially, then he spent the next 40 years uh, following up on his PhD thesis, doing all kinds of further analysis, uh, which brought us to this idea of uh, the, the CAP-M, Capital Asset Pricing Model. Some of you from the introductory course might have heard about that. And, and for that, he received actually a Nobel Prize back in 1992. So it kind of took 40 years from the PhD to, 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 to get the Nobel Prize. And, and kind of the, the funny uh, anecdote is that when in 1952 he, he had finalized his, uh, his PhD on this, on this topic, presenting his model, uh, he was kind of unsure whether or not he had done enough to, to, to go through his PhD. And the, the examiners were not quite sure if that was because he was from the, from the uh, economical faculty. And what he had done was not really economy. And then there was a, a, one of the examiners uh, who had to examine him at, the, at his PhD defense was a, was a well-known mathematician uh, who really think, thought that, the, that, that his math mathematical contribution was not really deep enough, right? So he was, uh, he, he was you know, coming from the Department of Economics, uh, University of Chicago, and he didn't have essentially any economical contributions and the mathematics were not deep enough. But, but anyway, they kind of let him pass through. But then, then we'll kind of later found out that he had laid the groundwork for uh, what we call kind of modern asset allocation theory, right? So that's, that's uh, uh, and then that's the, the thing that finally he got his, his uh, Nobel Prize uh, for in 1992. But when I go through the model, you will find out that this is a pretty simple model. So, so per se, it's not, I mean, you will see that mathematical sophistication is not very high and the economical contribution probably not very high either, but sometimes simple models are actually more more useful than more complicated models. And what is more important is a frame of uh, mind, as, as a frame of thinking in, in, uh, in asset allocation using optimization techniques that he introduced to the world that uh, many, many researchers uh, since, since uh, 1952 have been building on top of, right? So some of the other models that you're gonna see in this course, they are all extensions to that way of thinking, even though the models might look very different. Still, they are all building on top of the works of Harry Markovich from 1952. So in that sense, you could say that Harry Markovich was the, was the founder of optimization in finance, introducing a formal optimization model, uh, tackling a classical financial asset allocation problem, All right? So let's go through what that model is about. Um, and before that, we need a couple of um, introduc um, kind of introductions to the input parameters of, of, of the Markovich model. Um, essentially, there are two simple uh, inputs to the Markovich model. The purpose of Markovich model, for one thing, is to, to find out what is the optimal allocation to a set of assets if you want to, to, to invest your money, right? Um, and for that, you need to have um, an idea of uh, expected returns of the individual assets. And then you need to know what is the covariance uh, uh, matrix of the, uh, of the returns of these assets. Right, so these are the two inputs. I'll get back to how they, they come together. But first, let's just look into the, um, how, how they are defined individually. Um, so we are looking into a set of assets. Uh, we call them I, going from one to N, set of assets or instruments. Um, so if you will, I will intercha interchangeably call them assets or actives or, or instruments. Could be stocks or bonds or uh, mutual funds, financial products that you can invest in, right? Those are the in instruments. So we have N instruments and then we have a time series, time steps for which we have prices for these instruments. So, so the only thing we, we have is historical uh, prices of these financial instruments, right? And the way we calculate return is that we say the price today minus the price yesterday divided by the price yesterday. This is the, the return calculated in uh, discrete time steps, right? So, so we'll, let's keep it to discrete time steps for, for, for now and probably for, for, 
for the entirety of this, this course, that will suffice. Um, and then the way you average that, you say, well, if I have 10 different uh, time points, then I get nine returns, and then I multiply, so I just sum uh, these nine returns and divide it by, by the number of uh, observation, no, number of uh, returns that I have. So, so I have time one, time two, time three, let's say, to time 10. So, uh, and I have a price at time one and a price at time two, right? So the first return that I get is the return at time two, which is then my, uh, is my return, sorry, is my uh, price. at time two minus price at time one divided by price at time one, right? So that's simple calculation of the return. And you see if I have 10 points, then I get 10 observations, historical steps, then I get nine returns. That's why I divide by T minus one, T being the number of observations of prices that I had, right? So pretty simple, uh, basic math, uh, just for calculating the returns. Uh, from historically observed prices, right? Now, the, the question comes later whether historical data would be a good representation for expected returns of the future. It's a very good question. We are not going to address it in this uh, lecture. I'm going to get back to that uh, later towards the end of the course. We'll discuss, discuss this uh, a little bit, how, how we can. Can we have other expectations? But uh, for, for today and, and for the project work that uh, you will be doing, we can just look into uh, historical um, observations of prices and based on that you can have an expectation of well this is going to be my expected return in the long run as well. Right and then we have the the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix um, as which is used as a measure of risk in the Markovich setting um, where the covariance matrix is defined defined as like, like that. So you have the average returns for, uh, for the asset I. And covariance uh, says something about how the, um, how the prices of, how, how the returns of two, two uh, different assets are correlating with each other, covariating with each other, right? So if you have, just to get an understanding of, of how this, this, this formula works, then let's say if you have asset uh, one and asset two, mu i and mu j for bring two different assets, then uh, we are observing, you know, the returns from, you know, from the first, from the, you know, from the second observation to the last one. Then, um, so let's, let's say if at the same time you have a return for asset one, which is greater than its average, and the same, at the same time you have the return of asset two being greater than its average for all different time steps. So if either the returns of asset one and two are higher than their average or they are lower than their average. Would that give a positive or negative uh, co correlation or covariance? Right, because you, exactly, so that's the point. So, so if both of them are higher, if, if they're at the same time higher or lower, if they're higher or lower, you would then get either both positive or both negative, but you multiply the negatives, then you get the, the positive. So, so that is the definition of positive correlation, right? But if at the times where the one is over its average, the other is under its average, then they have different signs, the one positive, the other negative, then you get a lot of negative. Uh, and that, that was essentially the core contribution of Markovich, right? And then you could, you could understand why the mathematics professor back in 1952 thought that that contribution was not deep enough mathematically, right? Because I just explained it to you in, in less than one minute and then you know, all, of, all of you can do a, do a PhD if you, if you came up with something as simple as that. Um, but I, of course, it was, if it was, it would, it would be as useful as that, probably that would go through both for a PhD and maybe also a Nobel Prize, who knows, right? But that, that's essentially, that was the core contribution of the Markovich model coming up with uh, the covariance matrix as a measure of risk. Because that, the, the thinking was that, well, um, we can, if, if we go back historically and have an idea into whether the assets are, you know, they, they are correlating 
positively or negatively to, to each other, and then we, we, we form portfolios of assets which try to reduce the total what they call portfolio variance that they also defined. We'll get back to that in a minute. If then, then we make, then, then introduce the idea of um, a co um, a diversification based on, on portfolio variance, and then that's going to that's gonna remove uh, financial risk to, to a certain extent from uh, what's called idiosyncratic uh, financial risk uh, from, from our, our portfolio. All right, so all the risk that can be removed uh, then could be removed by, by using a method like this, given some assumptions. I'll get back to that as, as well. And of course, then uh, we have a special case of a covariance is the variance, where you have the covariance of the same asset with itself, right? And that would obviously be always a, pos a positive number. Right, so here is the, the, the Markowitz model. So that was the model he, he presented back in 1952, where he essentially saying um, that we want to maximize that, that objective function. Um, and that objective function that you see on the top, you're maximizing two different terms. So um, the first term, uh, summing uh, mu times x, uh, summing them over i, that is, what does it represent? Yes, portfolio return, right? So this, this is uh, uh, kind of the, the uh, portfolio average return, right? The average or expected return of the portfolio. We want to, to maximize that. Um, and then before getting to the second term, right, if we are maximizing to negative of something, then in, in a sense we are doing what? Minimizing. Then we are minimizing, right? So this, this is a bi-objective optimization model where you are maximizing return while at the same time minimizing risk, right? And the way you do that is by putting some weights, because we, um, you know, we, we, if, if you don't put any weights, that means that we have equal weights on both of them. But if you're putting weights called lambda in this case, then you can change the, the lambdas. And then you don't get one solution, but you get a frontier of solutions, which is called an efficient frontier, right? So by changing values of lambda, you can put different uh, weights on whether you want to maximize risk to a higher degree than minimizing, sorry, maximizing return to a higher degree than minimizing risk. And, and for different values of lambda, you get different values, which would look something like this. And by the way, the convention is that you have the risk here, and in the, which in the, uh, the Markovic term, the risk is defined as the sum over i and j of the weight on asset i multiplied by the covariance matrix of i and j times the weight on j, summing that up. So that term is called portfolio variance. So the risk in the Markowitz setting is portfolio variance. And here you have the expected return. Right? And well, in, in our case for now, we are just taking expected return as the average historical return. But then there are other ways. You can use um, the machine learning techniques, or you can use economic uh, 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 kind of forecasting models, or what have you, to come up with other and better um, estimates of future expected return. None of them, unfortunately, work all that well. So at the end of the day, if you're using just historical returns or if you're using something more advanced, you can't be quite sure that you can do it better than just looking into um, historical expected uh, returns. Um, whereas the measure of risk is normally more robust, right? So, so one of the ideas around using optimization methods is to focus more on risk management rather than trying to second guess the future. Here is about second guessing the future. At the end of the day, if I knew that one asset is going to have a higher expected return than the other, what would be the, the rational thing to do in the long run if I was a long-term investor? Or let's, let's even look at the model. So, so let's say if, if, uh, the, if the value of lambda is zero, what happens with lambda zero? The second term disappears, right? So for lambda zero, I would be just maximizing expected return. Then can anybody tell me what would the, the model find if I'm just maximizing expected return? What is, what is the nature of the solution of, of that model? Yeah. Highest return, uh, of course. 
Right, the highest expected return, right? So you put 100% of the money in the one asset which, which you guess has the highest expected return, right? So, so that would be the natural um, way of thinking um, if, if, we were, if we had good methods, good models, to tell us exactly what asset is going to have the highest expected return in the future, then why bother to take a course like this? Then you can just put all your money on that one. So you, you maybe want to take a course which doesn't deal with uh, risk management, looking into this term, but only focus on finding good estimates for future return. But then you can think of the problem with that thinking. Because if such methods were there, would you think that somebody actually would take advantage of them? Probably yes. And if people start trying to take advantage of those, those methods, what would happen with the perf performance of those methods? They won't be always the highest one. Right. So because your, your actions always change the output. That's what's, what we call in, in, in financial markets or in economy in general, that our actions are actually have an impact on the, kind of the, the, the subject matters that we are, we are actually working with. So, so, so this kind of financial... In, in, in finance, we call this um, the, the, the price of financial assets is, is called an endogenous parameter. So there's, you have the difference between endogenous and exogenous. Like an exogenous uh, a variable could be the wind, like how the wind is blowing. Doesn't really, the wind doesn't care uh, you know, if, if you have a model at uh, DTU Compute, if you have if come up with a model that which is going to guess how strong the wind is going to blow, in which direction the wind is going to blow next week. The wind is going to blow the way the wind wants to blow, right? No matter what your actions are, the way you want to put the, the turbines or the, the, the windmills to take advantage of the, the, the wind or plan for your electricity uh, production, for example, of that week, right? So that's, uh, so, so the, 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 the blowing of the wind is an exa exogenous uh, variable to your model. Whereas the prices in financial markets are endogenous to your models. So that's, that's why um, it's kind of a contradiction in term to have a, a good model which could always guess the future expected returns. That said, there are, there are people who are trying to do that and there are small, short periods of time that you might be capturing some signals and, and act on that, but that's not what we're focusing on. On, on this course, the main focus would be working with risk management when it comes to asset allocation. Right? Any uh, questions in understanding? Oh, I didn't draw the, the, the efficient frontier. So, so the efficient frontier looks something like this. So this point would be the one with, where you have a lot of focus on, on risk. You have very little risk. And normally you have, oh, well, I mean, that's uh, essentially by the way the financial markets work, the, little, the, the, the less risk you want to accept, the less return you should expect as well. And this point is the one where you are getting maximum risk and maximum return. And normally you see this, this shape that, um, that it's, 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 not, it's not a linear shape. So, so you are, uh, the more risk you are taking, you are not necessarily taking uh, you know, excess return corresponding to that in, in linear. It would be actually falling down. So after some point, probably it's not really, you're not really getting much uh, returns from, your, uh, from the extra excess risk that you're taking. So this is the, the usual, usual shape of this, this curve. Any questions to the Markowitz model or the way risk and return were defined is quite clear? Yeah, was one question. Ah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Essentially, this is this, this, this two. Let, let's uh, just spend a minute on that as well. So, so sum of x is equal to 1. That means that you have to invest 100% of your money. So in this case, 1 represents all your money. Right? And uh, x greater than 0 means that we have to have a long position in, 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 in all these stocks. That's not actually the, uh, a requirement of the Markowitz model as he introduced it back in 1952, but um, we're going to get actually back to that because adding this constraint makes solving this model a bit, a bit more difficult. So he didn't, uh, when Markowitz solved the original problem, it, it looked like this. So actually the x's then could be both positive and negative. And you might have been presented to that version of it also in the, in the introductory course, but essentially having x's greater than, 
Zero means that no short selling is allowed. But we're going to talk about short selling next week. And uh, you will, uh, yeah, you can, you can ask questions on that. For, but for now, it's just, it means we have to spend all the money on, on buying the stocks. And we are not allowed to short sell. Any other questions? Right, otherwise I'm done for the, for the lecture part. Uh, we're going to take a break of, uh, let's say, until 10 past, 10 past 2, and then we're back for, for the exercises.